so um, okay, let's think about data. Okay, let's say we've got a data set. All right, so let's say I gather data about um, flight information. I go to the airport and I say, okay, um, I just want to know uh, information about the uh, the flights that will leave in the next hour. Okay, and so they tell me, all right, you've got um, uh, American Airlines flight one two three, and you have uh, United Airlines flight uh, three four five, and um, whatever Southwest um, six seven eight, and so on and so forth. And each flight, for each flight, we get um, the uh, destination. Okay, and this one's going to uh, Boston, and this one's going to uh, JFK, and this one's going to, um, uh, no, we're, let's say we're at LAX, so let's say um, Dallas, Fort Worth, or whatever, okay, and then we get um, um, the number of passengers, all right, so this one has 203, and this one has 185, and this one has... Uh, and uh, I don't know, let's see, um, manufacturer of plane, okay, and so this one's like Boeing, and this is uh, also Boeing, and this is an Airbus, who knows, okay, I'm just making information up here. Uh, Oh, okay, and let's say um, distance to the destination, and so let's say this is, uh, I don't know, 3,800 miles, and uh, this is 3,700, and this is uh, 1,800. Okay, again, just making up, making things up. All right, so this is just some fictional data set that I've made up, and these are flights that are leaving and whatever the next three flights leaving from LAX or something. Okay, what is what is the who in this data set? What's the who? Yeah. What's the who? A A U S. Each line, each line is a who. So each flight is a who. It's not the manufacturer, it's not the it's not the airline company, it's not the pilot, okay, or the people on the airplane. I mean we're accustomed to hearing who being a person, but it's not, okay? In this case the who is each flight. It's each line in my table represents a who, or in this case, a subject, a very uh, a subject or a case. Each flight is a case or subject in my table. That is my who. Okay, it's not the airline. It's not manufacturers or the pilots or whatever. Those aren't who's. Each line. Okay. What kind of variables have I collected? My what? Destination, passengers. Yeah, I got destination, passengers. Manufacturer. The manufacturer. Distance. And the distance. These are my variables. <coughs> okay. Which ones are categorical and which ones are numeric? Destination, is this categorical or numeric? Categorical. Categorical. Okay. Passenger? Numeric. Numeric, okay. Manufacturer? Categorical. Categorical, okay. And the distance? Numeric. Numeric. What if uh, what if I include another category and uh, and say um, destination zip code? Okay, 
and I don't know zip codes, but you know, let's say this is one, three, four, five, two, and this is uh, you know, one, one, two, eight, seven. I'm, I'm making these up, these are not correct at all. And then let's say this is four, three, three, four, six, okay. Categorical. Yeah, zip code would be categorical. They're numbers, but they don't tell us how much or how many. They give us a, put us into a category, one of the whatever, thousands of zip code categories that we've got, but they put us into a, it tells us which type or where, where or what, what's going on. It doesn't tell us how much or how many. It doesn't make sense to say this flight has, you know, 30,000 more zip code. Okay, that doesn't make sense. Okay, we're talking about area code. All right, it doesn't make sense to say area code uh, 310 has uh, 200 less area code than area code 562 or something like that. Okay, we can't can't compare area codes like that. So area codes are categorical, even though they look like numbers. Now, what if we wanted to summarize some, some of this data, okay? Summarizing data. Well, uh, I mean, this is a very trivial example Okay, we've got three flights here, so there's not a whole lot of information we have. But let's say I wanted to summarize this, okay? If we're going to summarize a categorical variable, we create a frequency table, okay? So for categorical data, we can create categorical variables that I have. So let's say we pick manufacturer. Let's say that's our categorical variable. So, uh, for uh, the, uh, the variable manufacturer, okay, let's make a frequency table. This is what it's going to look like. Manufacturer, and then we've got a frequency, okay? So one of the manufacturers I see is Boeing. And uh, and in my data set, how many um, how many flights have airplanes made by Boeing? Two. two. So my frequency is there. Two is two, and then the other one is Airbus, and they have made. And in my data set, one flight has a plane made by Airbus. So for that, I put frequency one. Okay. No surprise on getting how I got this two and one, right? Okay, and so you could just imagine somebody else you know, because it would take too much to uh, to make a whole uh, list off a whole data set in class. I only have three lines, but you could just imagine somebody else, maybe what if we went around this classroom and we said, um, you know, tell us whether you are uh, 
uh, male or female, okay? So I go through and I, uh, in that case, what is my who? Because everybody student. Student. Each student mm -hmm. is a different case, all right? And then what is the variable that I'm collecting? Gender. Gender, Gender. okay? <laughs> and so what would my frequency table look like at the end of that? So let's say make a frequency table. For gender, you know, from, uh, you know, or just uh, from using our data, using our <coughs> quote unquote classroom as a sample. males we have in this class we put there and however many females we have in this class we put here and uh, and in total we should have about 65 because there's about 65 of you enrolled and so maybe I w if I put 22 here what number would go here? It would be about 43. <coughs> 43 right because 22 plus 43 <laughs> adds up to 65 okay I could put that on your no calculator part of the quiz. You should be able to do that. Okay, so this is our F, yeah? Okay, and then, uh, and we could, uh, you know, if, uh, so these, so far there have only been two categories, but, uh, but we could also go around and we say, uh, you know, what is your hair color, okay? And we might have more, categories here, okay, and, uh, and, you know, anytime you're dealing with a categorical variable, you, not everyone's going to fit perfectly into certain categories, right? Even male and female, something, something we take for, for granted sometimes, but not everybody fits neatly, nice and neatly into one or, one or the other category uh, all the time, you know, about one in every 5,000 births. Is, uh, is ambiguous, and uh, and then you know somebody has to make a decision, and or I don't, you know, it's it's complicated, and so uh, so you know hair color, we could just say things like uh, blonde and brown and black hair and um, I don't know red hair and other, right? To try to get every other. Okay, and, then, and then, so then you have to go go through the class and say, please identify. And you know, at, at some point, you can't say some of these surveys. You just have to say, what color hair do you identify your hair as? Okay, and that way you avoid this uh, somebody saying, now your hair is blonde, and somebody says, no, it's brown, and whatever. Okay. And so you just say, you know, what, how do you self-identify in terms of hair color? And, and, then, and then we'll go through and we'll get some numbers here, right? And again, this whole thing should add up to 65, okay? And, uh, and yeah, you know, maybe these aren't the best categories, but whatever, okay? Let's just say uh, 2010. Okay, whatever. I, I made up numbers, and they're they're certainly not correct, but there we there we go. We got a frequency table. Okay. Um, 
we can extend these frequency tables and turn them into relative frequency tables. Okay. And that's just adding uh, an extra column, relative frequency. And, uh, and this, and we turn our uh, frequencies into percentages, okay? So I say, how do, what percentage of my class is male? What do I do there? 65, 22 by 65. 22 divided by 65. And I get 33.8%. And if that's 33.8%, what does this have to be? 66.2, right? Because everything has to add up to 100%. Okay, and then so, and then I do the same thing over here and I get some other numbers here. I don't feel like doing that. Okay, but we get the concept here. Yeah. All right, and again, frequency tables, what kind of data do we use these for? Categorical. Categorical data. Good. Now, sometimes, uh, maybe uh, we went around and we asked everybody, you know, are you male or female, and what is your hair color? We can create something called a two-way table. <laughs> And again, this is for categorical data, but now we're looking at two categorical variables at the same time, okay? The two-way table is also called a contingency table. Say, okay, so we'll have hair color. And uh, is your hair blonde or is it brown? You gotta pick a color. Black, red, or other. And then uh, and then we go uh, with gender. So here, uh, total, I have 20 blonde-haired people total, and 30 brown-haired people, and 10 black-haired people, and 3 and 2, and, and, uh, and over here I've got a total of 22 males and 43 females, again, a fictional class, and then so, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe there's five blonde males and 15 blonde females and, uh, uh, I don't know, eight brown-haired males, so that leaves 22 of that, and maybe we'll have two and eight, and, I don't know, i got to increase this. I'm going to run out of numbers here. Just uh, five and uh, two and uh, it's going to have to be three 
so this is a two-way table because it breaks up the total number of 65 people total, and we've broken them out into whether they are male or female, whether they are blonde-haired males, or brown-haired males, or black-haired females, or whatever, okay? We, uh, we split them into all of the different categories there. Is that, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Alright. Oh, and another interesting fact about hair color that nobody really cares about, but I hear these things when I'm erasing the board. Um, there are two uh, known genome types for that produce blonde hair. Um, the most common one is the uh, the one found among uh, European or uh, nations in the uh, near the Arctic that develop uh, blonde hair. So originally from the Scandinavian countries, and that's probably, if any of you have blonde hair, it can be traced back to, uh, to those. And also, uh, but there's blonde hair that developed in, on its own in uh, Melanesia, so it's a Pacific Island nation, and, uh, and so I don't know if you guys know the uh, musician Cisco. Yeah. <laughs> had a popular song in the time. 15 years ago, <laughs> involving a thong, and, uh, he had blonde hair, and that was that was naturally blonde really? hair. Oh, from, uh, it looks, it, it seems. I mean, I, we shouldn't say it looks fake because that's that's kind of rude. But um, it, it seems unusual because uh, uh, because not very many people have blonde hair um, and and a darker skin complexion. But uh, but these. These people developed it on their own in, uh, uh, in these Pacific Island nations. So anyway, that's kind of interesting. But uh, anyway, two-way table. Again, what kind of data are we dealing with there? Categorical. Categorical data, and we've got two variables, and we break those out. Okay. And then so somebody could say, what percentage of males have blonde hair? and we get 22.7%. Uh, okay, and then what if somebody said, what percentage of blondes are male? Blondes are male? Five divided by 20. And what's your answer there? Five divided by 20. Five divided by 20. They sound similar, but they're very distinct, okay? And you have to be able to distinguish one from the other, otherwise we're going to be in trouble. And then maybe the one that also throws off the most is um, what percentage of students uh, are blonde haired males? Some of you guys picking this up right away, that's fantastic. Others of you, maybe you're not quite sure what just happened here, okay? Um, please have this down in your notes and, and see if you can um, make up your own questions and ask questions like, you know, what percentage of red-haired people are female and what percentage of... Um, Females have black hair and things like that. Okay, make up your own questions. Make sure you can you you've got this concept. Okay, maybe your friend understands it, but you don't quite understand it. Ask your friend to help you. Okay, 
Um, we don't we don't have time to spend all day on this, and uh, and I know some of you guys have this down, so I feel okay moving on here. Uh, all right. The uh, the book makes a point of distinguishing between an experiment and an observational study, and this is uh, this is a good point to make. Okay, so it, it feels like we're taking a little break from here, but um, we're going to just talk about experiments. Decisions based on data, um, this de-emphasizes the importance of anecdotes. And I know anecdotes uh, are sometimes compelling um, evidence, okay? Uh, you know, people like to hear stories. Oh, you know, I knew so-and-so, and they had this and this issue going on, and then they tried this thing out, and their issue disappeared, okay, you know, it could be so-and-so was, you know, had cancer, and so they tried this strange thing, and uh, and then their cancer went away, and that's, that's awesome, you know, and, um, or, you know, so-and-so, um, you know, whatever, had <coughs> financial trouble, and then they went and did this thing, and then, you know, they made a lot of money, okay, so anecdotes are kind of interesting, and they're nice to hear, but in terms of data and how we're going to make decisions and stories, or not decisions and stories, but how we're going to make decisions based off of data, what we really have to depend on are experiments and observational studies, okay? We can't really rely on anecdotes, okay? That's what the lottery tries to sell you. They sell you an idea of this story where you can say, hey, I won a billion dollars or whatever, X amount of money, and then everything was solved. But the truth is, is a lot of people play the lottery each week, and maybe one person wins, okay? Sometimes a couple more people win, but rarely do people win, And uh, but they like to sell the idea or the dream. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, playing the lottery, is a, it's a waste of money. I'm just, I'm just telling you right now, okay? So <laughs> chances are you're not going to win. I can almost guarantee you're not going to win, but nothing is impossible here, okay? Okay, so with experiments, the difference between an experiment and observational study is that in experiments, we actively interfere with our subjects, okay? We assign um, treatments to our subjects. Treatments is just a, a set of conditions. It's not not necessarily you're going to get some radiation therapy or something. It's just uh, a treatment is uh, a set of conditions. And we try to control as many sources of variation as possible. mean by 
by control as many sources of variation as possible, we basically, we try to make all of our subjects as similar, ha have the uh, similar conditions as possible with the exception of the treatment, okay? So we want all of our subjects similar conditions as possible <coughs> except for the treatment. So a good experiment, okay, well, the best possible experiment, you know, maybe we can't even do. But, you know, let's say you had the question and you wanted to know, does uh, having a l consuming a lot of vitamin C, does that help, um, does that help minimize people getting the common cold? Let's say we have that question, all right? What we would like to do in an experiment is we want, let's say we got a bunch of volunteers for this experiment. We're gonna create two groups. We're gonna have one group that gets lots of vitamin C and the other group that either gets no vitamin C or minimal vitamin C, okay? Now, um, we don't stop there. Ideally, okay, because there's a whole bunch of reasons why someone might get sick or not, okay? It could do with how much sleep they get, how much exercise, the other things they eat, the people they come in contact with. There's all sorts of things that go into whether someone might get sick or not, okay? The question is, we're not concerned about all these other things. We want to know, does having lots of vitamin C reduce um, whether, you know, does that reduce the rate at which people get sick, okay? So ideally, we would have two groups of people, and ideally, we could control everything about their lives as possible. Ideally, both groups would get the same amount, everybody in, in the entire experiment would get the same amount of sleep. Everybody would do the same amount of exercise. Everybody's diet would look exactly the same, with the exception that one group gets more vitamin C than the other. Everybody, the people they interact with would be the same, okay? And then we could see uh, because everything else for these two groups were exactly the same, except for the vitamin C, if we see one group get more sick than the other group, then we can say the reason why they got sick at different rates was because of the vitamin C. Okay, That's what we want to be able to say. But if we don't control all of these other things, then we just say, okay, these people are getting vitamin C, these people aren't getting vitamin C, go about and live your own lives, okay? We might find one group getting a lot more sick than the other group, okay? But then we have no idea if it's really because of the vitamin C or if it's one of the million other things that go on in someone's life that could affect whether or not they get sick, okay? So in an experiment, we try to control everything except for the treatment so that if we do detect a difference, we can say the reason is the treatment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we do this um, with the hope of making a cause and effect conclusion. Okay. So if done right, we can make a cause. On the other hand, we have observational studies. In observational studies, we just observe. We don't really interfere with people's lives. We let them live their life as they want. Okay. 
We do not assign treatment. don't really interfere with their lives. Okay. Other than the fact that maybe we take some measurements, okay, other than we gather some data. And and gathering data in of itself could could change things, right? People are more likely to floss their teeth when they know that their dentist is going to look at their teeth. So just, just the fact that they know that people are going to be studied might change some of their behavior. But other than that, we try not, we try not to impose things on, on people. Okay? So we don't really interfere with their lives other than the, the observing. Okay. And, and it's not. It doesn't have to be like in a lab setting where you're behind some glass glass windows and you're watching people. Okay, it could just be live your lives and then come back in a few weeks and we'll take some measurements. Come back in another couple weeks and we we'll just get some checkup information on you. Okay. So with an observational study, we can never make a cause and effect conclusion. We can never make. But you see people breaking this rule all the time. They say, oh, you know, scientists studied or basically observed a whole 100 people, and they found people <coughs> with higher uh, concentrations of vitamin A in their blood were more likely to have this and less likely to have this, OK? And they say things like that. And maybe the data supports that, except it's wrong to make a cause and effect conclusion and then make the recommendation. Um, therefore, you should start taking vitamin A if you want these benefits in your life. Okay? Because we don't know, we have no idea if, if it's the vitamin A that's causing it or if there's other things that, that change something. Maybe their better health causes them to retain more vitamin A. Okay? So maybe somebody says, oh, we found that people in good health have higher m amounts of vitamin A in their blood, okay? So we have no idea if just having good health causes people to hold on to more vitamin A, okay? And if you have bad health, injecting vitamin A into your body may not do anything, okay? So we can't make cause and effect conclusions from observational studies, okay? So why do we even bother with observational studies? Well. Uh, sometimes, I mean, ideally we could do experiments, but people have feelings and, uh, and people are valuable, and so experiments may not always be ethical, okay? So for example, what if we, let's say somebody said, you know what, I want to know the effect of cocaine on someone's uh, ability to think, okay? Let's get some volunteers, all right? <laughs> All right, and they get 100 volunteers and say, thanks for signing up for this study. You're going to help us advance science. And uh, we randomly assigned you guys. And guess what? You 50, thank you for volunteering. You are going to start uh, using cocaine uh, every day for the next 10 weeks. And you guys are not going to use any cocaine. And then we're going to come back and see what your lives look like in 10 weeks. OK? That, that's not going to work, okay? That's um, that's a highly unethical study, and so um, so we don't know what the uh, the we would not be able to make cause and effect conclusions about that, okay? And that was um, you know for the same reason we couldn't do experiments with uh, with smokers and things like that. We couldn't say, guess what? You're going to start smoking a pack of cigarettes, and we're going to see if you develop lung cancer. Um, we couldn't do things like that, so. Um, 
So it was difficult to establish cause and effect for smoking and lung cancer, right? uh, because all we had were observational studies, and when we observed, it sure seemed like people who smoked developed lung cancer at a much higher rate. That was what we observed. Um, but the drug company, or not the, drug, the big tobacco, would always come back and say, "Well, we can't, uh, we can't say smoking causes lung cancer." As far as we know, these people were genetically predisposed to develop lung cancer anyway, and because of their genetic predisposition to develop lung cancer, they were seeking something out to enter their lungs, and uh, and that's why they picked up smoking. Okay, so it was the. the genetics that was causing them to seek out smoking, or things like that, right? And I mean, that seems like nonsense, but in truth, it's hard to argue against it, okay? Because you could never do an experiment, okay? And you could do experiments with rats, but then they would say, well, rats aren't people, and so uh, that's true. So anyway, um, you've got experiments and observational studies. These are the primary differences between experiments and observational studies, okay? Um, and I guess uh, yeah, we can't always do experiments. Experiment, you might use an observational study. Um, and that's that, okay. Um, I'm going to just put a few topics on here and, uh, and I'll leave it to you guys to do the reading about what each of these topics are. Um, so, for experiments, um, we have a control group, okay. We have a treatment group and a control group, generally. Right. Um, we also have um, some of the tools used. In experiments. Just some uh, reading to do on, on those subjects. I think it's pretty straightforward, uh, so it should be okay. All right. Um, okay, you get. Uh, you'll have some homework exercises uh, associated with that. Um, we're going to continue on and uh, deal with some uh, graphical displays here. Oh, wait, we're, we're, we're not done, sorry. If I gave you that impression here, okay? Uh, okay, uh, continue on. Uh, we're going to do a chapter two, and we're going to talk about... Um, Visualizing, uh, we're going to talk about um, some numeric features in numeric data. Okay, so chapter two, uh, sections one and two. Okay, and we're going to talk about, um, uh, I guess, uh, visualizing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, 
I generally go all the way up to 10 o'clock every single class, so. Um, and I know at a certain point, your brains cannot handle that much more, but uh, it just keeps coming. So, uh, <laughs> All right, so numeric data, okay, this tells us what? How much or how many, right? Okay, so just imagine um, our data set. Okay, so let's say uh, we, uh, we created a data set and uh, Okay. Let's say we went around the classroom and uh, and I asked you, um, how tall are you? Okay. And so uh, so we go around and each student, okay, each student has a name, right? So we have. Uh, okay. Well, we got student one, some name, okay. Mary and uh, and let's say Mary is. Uh, how tall is she? Let's say she's 5'2". So in inches, how tall is that? 62 inches, okay? And then, um, and then we have uh, the next student, student 2, is, uh, let's say is Joe. And uh, how tall is Joe? Let's say he is 5'9", so he's 69 inches. And uh, student 3, uh, Jesus. Mary, Joe, and Jesus, and uh, <laughs> let's say uh, Jesus is uh, uh, six feet tall. All right, okay, and then, then and so we go on, and uh, oh, Gabriel, and um, <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm having too much fun here. Okay, um, and he's 65 inches, and so on. Okay, we got, uh, let's say, uh, we gathered a whole bunch of people. Uh, we went around and uh, so we have a total of 60, if we have 65 students, we have a total of 65 different entries here, right? And, and each person has uh, a different height. And so to, uh, to graph this, okay, one thing we can make is a dot plot. So with a dot plot, first you got to make yourself uh, a number line. So let's say uh, I start off at 55. This is a dot plot. Dot plot. D O T P L O T. Say, uh, so you make yourself a number line, and then for every data point, you just put a dot at that number. So Mary is represented by a dot at 62. Joe is uh, represented by a dot at 69. Jesus, dot at 72. Gabriel, a dot at 65. Okay. And this would be a dot plot of the four people that I have listed in our data set. Okay. Now, if I went through the entire classroom and created a dot plot um, for every single person, how many dots would I have in my dot plot? Sixty-five. I would have sixty-five dots. Okay. And uh, so let's just, you know, let's just say uh, we did this, and and maybe my dot plot looks something like this. Okay. So I'm just. Um, This is, I, I just quickly made up a dot plot for, just pretend there's a whole bunch of dots here, okay? <laughs> if I had a computer, I would just show all these dots on the board, but I can't do that, okay? 
And then, so this is what a dot plot with a few more dots might look like, okay? Um, I'm not gonna bother writing every single one out, okay? But again, yeah, 65 students, we would have 65 dots, and, and we'd have something that looks like this, okay? At a certain point, when you've got a whole bunch of people, the dot plots, um, there's so many dots, it gets really crowded looking, okay? And so, sometimes instead of a dot plot, we might make a histogram, okay? And with a histogram, what we do, same concept, we got a number line uh, across the bottom here, and rather than dots, I'm gonna turn this dot plot into a histogram. You have bars indicating how tall each, uh, each column is, okay? So it looks a lot, it looks just like the dot plot, but maybe it looks like this. Okay, something, all right? So it presents the same information as the dot plot, but it's uh, in bar form. this thing, what is this thing called? Histogram. A histogram. This is a dot plot. And what kind of data are we dealing with here? Numerical, numeric. numeric data. Okay, so numeric data. We've got dot plots and histograms. What do we have for categorical data? We have uh, frequency tables. Frequency, frequency tables. tables, okay. And we'll talk about graphs for uh, categorical variables next week. But All right, so we've got histograms. Basically, you're turning um, the dots into bars and things of this nature, okay? Um, there's something called a stem plot. You can read about that. It's not that important, but, but it also exists, okay? So read about stem plots. say I, I gathered a bunch of data on some group of people and and, uh, and this is what the histogram looks like. Okay. Here, uh, we can talk about the, uh, the shape of the distribution and maybe even um, the idea of a central point. So what might be a central central number in this set? 67? Yeah, around 67, okay? So the idea of center is somewhere around 67, okay? For a central point. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get more into this idea of center in a, in a little uh, next week. Uh, and how would we describe this shape here? Okay, so the word I'm looking for here is symmetric. Okay, and what does it mean to be symmetric? It's well, the same on both sides. yeah, okay, the idea of symmetry is you can put kind of like a mirror down the middle and it's going to be the same on both sides. Okay, in terms of this, all right, remember, what, what is this representing here? Numeric data. Numeric data, height, okay. And what does it mean to have a tall peak here and 
a short bar over here. More students are sick. Yeah, we had a lot of students, or whatever this represents, a lot of students around 67 inches, okay? We have some students that are 70 inches, but not as many as we did at 67, okay? And we have uh, a few students who are like 73 inches. We have, you know, a few students who are 60 inches, but not very many. That's what these di the different heights mean, okay? We have a few at the short bars, we've got a lot at the tall bars, okay? So the heights of bars. Tell us how many uh, people have, you know, that particular measurement. That um, value as a So the idea of symmetric is that, okay, establish this central peak, okay? Once you've established the central peak, if you go um, far above it, the number that you have this far above is about the same as the number you have this far below, okay? So if I say 67 is around my center, and when I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 above 67, Okay, I have very few that are six units above 67. If I go six units below 67, I have about the same amount. <laughs> it's not going to be perfectly symmetric, but overall the idea is that you have about the same number when you go a certain distance above the center. <clears throat> certain distance above the center. Same number of people there as you would if you went that distance below the center. So that's, uh, that's the idea of symmetry, or symmetric numeric distribution. Okay. Uh, you might have something that looks like this. we say might be around the middle-ish point here. Third bar. Yeah, so middle might be somewhere right. somewhere around here, okay? Maybe, maybe, maybe over here, I don't know. So somewhere around here is uh, is middle, okay? Is this thing symmetric? No. No, no right? What's going on? What happens is that Okay, I can go way above middle, like way out here, and I've got a few people. Not a lot, but I've got some. If I go that distance below, down over here, I have nobody. Okay? So we have some people some people exist, uh, you know, way above middle. Okay? And over here, 
no one exists um, that far below middle. So we call something like this right skew. And then sometimes, if we're too lazy to draw the individual bars, we'll just draw something that looks like this, okay? And it captures kind of the spirit of the uh, of the histogram there, okay? And uh, and we call this right skewed. And if you're gonna, um, um, and uh, and we have uh, we have just the opposite. And guess what we call this? Left, left, left skewed, right? So if you're trying to remember which one's right skewed and which one's left skewed, okay, just Pretend, you know, if we were in some battle royale or the Hunger Games, okay, and I were to <laughs> cut this out of the board and use it as a weapon, which side would I use to skewer someone? I would use the left side here, and I would use the right side there, okay? So that would be right skewed and left skewed, okay? So left skewed means we've got some people way below the middle, but no one way above. Okay, what's well, something that might be right skewed? Um, maybe people's weights, okay? Uh, people's weights, so we, I mean, if you think of, I don't know, average weight to be, let's say, uh, 170 pounds, okay? Um, there are people who maybe weigh uh, like 300 pounds or 350 pounds. Not a lot, but some people weigh maybe 350 pounds, okay? And, uh, and so that person, someone who weighs 350 pounds is 180 pounds over average, okay? If we call it the middle around 170. Uh, but if we want 180 pounds in the opposite direction, below average, okay? That would take us to negative 10 pounds. And nobody <laughs> exists at negative 10 pounds, okay? And so um, uh, human weight is something that we would consider to be right skewed, okay? A lot are in this kind of middle-ish region, but um, people have uh, do exist that are much higher, and uh, and nobody exists that are that much lower. Okay. Um, left skewed could be something like um, test scores. Okay, so when you take a test, the highest grade you can get may be uh, like 100 percent. Right? It's hard to get more questions right than what's offered on the exam, and so. Uh, so maybe you have a lot of people getting like 70, 80, 90% or 100%. Nobody is super high, but then you'll have some people getting like 20% or 30%, okay? Way below middle. And if you try to go that far above middle, you can't, you can't get that score. Okay, so that would be something that might be less skewed. Um, all right, so that's, uh, that's a little bit about shape there. Uh, another part about shape, so one part about shape is uh, whether it's symmetric or skewed. And another thing about shape is um, we might have one peak. Okay, or there could be uh, multiple peaks, something like that. So we would call this unimodal. This is bimodal. And what do you think this would be? Trimodal. Trimodal, okay, yes. Or um, usually we just say multimodal at this point. One, two, or many. Okay, so unimodal, things like height, unimodal, generally, um, things like uh, um, weight, also unimodal. Okay, what might be bimodal? Any, any example of a good bimodal? 
economy? What do you mean by economy? Okay, so so remember, this is not not about. Um, there's no up and down throughout the years, okay? Because there's no no element of time here. What is this? What do these represent? Numbers. A numeric numeric variable, right? Okay. And they're all just they're just there, okay? So we can't really. So economy, I would not say. Sickness. Huh? Sickness. Okay. So how do we measure sickness? Okay, so so sickness, I would say, is a categorical variable. People are sick or they're not sick, or I, I don't know. There's, there needs to be some kind of numeric numeric component here. So, yeah. Number of offspring. Number of offspring. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say that's bimodal, but at least it's a numeric variable. Okay. Probably the most common number of offspring is zero, and then maybe, uh, and then a lot of people will have one or two or three or whatever, five, seven, fifteen. Um, <laughs> but uh, in terms of people, you know, so I, you'd probably see uh, a skewed distribution there. Yeah. Um, heart rate. Heart rate. Okay. Heart rate, um, so what, what, you're thinking we would see a peak where and where? Oh, like in exercise, like if you take a break. And then <laughs> okay. Um, maybe, uh, okay, maybe this is too hard of a question here. Um, <laughs> okay, so something like um, uh, if we measured uh, testosterone levels in all the people in this classroom, okay? Probably we're not going to do that, but um, if we did, we would probably see two peaks here, okay? Um, there would be, uh, so everybody has some testosterone in their body, whether you're male or female, you're going to have some testosterone, and probably um, the, uh, the women will have um, a certain uh, amount, okay? Uh, this might be the average amount for women, and you might see... Um, a peak like that that exists uh, for women. Some women have more testosterone than other women. Other women have less testosterone than other women. Most women have around this amount of testosterone, okay? And then you'll probably see another peak um, for the men, okay? Um, some men have a, a lot more testosterone than others. Other men have less testosterone than others, but probably you won't have very many um, women who have much more testosterone than maybe the average male and uh, and like vice versa you're not going to have very many men who have much less testosterone than than the average uh, average woman okay and actually testosterone probably looks more something like this okay where there's really kind of this no man's land in terms of testosterone levels okay it's, it's very um, peak like this. <laughs> And this is actually now how, uh, at the Olympics, they decide whether someone is male or female. Okay, <laughs> you think it was simpler than that, but it's it's come down to this. All right. Um, uh, okay, so we'll uh, we'll take a break right there, and uh, we have a little bit of reading to do. Um, some What's exercises. The homework, the homework again is posted on the website. Uh, just look up homework one. And I guess the details of that. Thank you.